Yeah, so then we'll start our session one. The talk one, actually, let's welcome our first talk, Professor Kale uh, Jamison. The title is Reconfigurable uh, Meta Material Service for MMWave and the Satellite Networks. Kale actually is from uh, is a professor from computer science and uh, a social associate faculty in electronic and uh, computer engineering at Princeton University. His, his research focuses on mobile and wireless uh, system for sensing, localization, and communication, and also the massive parallel classical quantum and quantum inspired computing, compu computational structures for next general wireless communication system. So let's welcome uh, Kale to give the talk one. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And let's see. And can is my slide coming through now? Sure, sure. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, smart surfaces. And uh, I'll take as my jumping off point um, actually something that uh, the Victor's keynote uh, talked about, which is the different frequencies uh, that uh, the next generation of uh, 5G and 6G networks uh, are going to be using. And so I'll tell you today about uh, two, uh, two ideas for smart surfaces that my group is working on. The first is in uh, millimeter wave uh, communication, um, and the second is in uh, satellite communications. So the uh, demand for 5G and 6G networks is surging, um, and with those uh, new applications of 5G and 6G networks like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, the smartphone, uh, home, and robotic um, automation, the bandwidth requirements and the throughput requirements that these uh, networks need is growing and growing. And um, down at the lower frequencies, sub six gigahertz, where 4G and uh, the current uh, generation of 5G networks operate, um, there's extremely crowded and limited frequency spectrum. And so as we look into the future, um, we know that the millimeter wave uh, frequencies are going to be key. And these uh, millimeter wave uh, frequencies, uh, they start uh, down here at uh, 27 uh, gigahertz and they go all the way up to um, near the terahertz range, hundreds of gigahertz and uh, eventually terahertz ranges. And so the challenge of these um, millimeter wave uh, frequencies, however, is that they're very uh, susceptible to blockage. Um, as we know, by walls indoors, um, you know that uh, when a millimeter wave uh, signal goes through a wall, um, it can lose as much as 20 decibels of um, 20 decibels or more of uh, of uh, attenuation. And also, the human body is very good at blocking uh, millimeter wave signals. And so you get similar um, outages due to uh, humans walking in between the base station and the um, and the uh, mobile uh, node. And so these high losses they lead to communication glitches, um, and they make these millimeter wave networks extremely unreliable. And so. We thought we were looking and thinking, how can we improve this situation? And the situation occurs in a number of different scenarios um, that are of interest to uh, 5G and 6G um, networks. Now, the first one is the outdoor to indoor uh, scenario. So you may have a, um, a millimeter wave base station outside a building, and you may want to bring this signal in uh, to a user that's uh, inside the building. And so um, we have an opportunity if we have a smart surface that's sitting on the wall of or the window of the building uh, to bring the signal in. And, and what these smart surfaces can do and what our solution does, our solution is called MM Wall. What our solution does is it uh, transmits the or refracts the incoming signal um, in a way that is completely programmable. And so with an electronic uh, electronic control signal to the smart surface. The smart surface can rotate the beam um, into an arbitrary direction, uh, which is not possible without um, electronic control. And so our solution, MM Wall, is one of the first uh, systems to have this electronic control so that we can bring service um, outdoors to indoors and track a user as a user moves um, around. 
indoors, um, a user might be uh, connected to a virtual a base station and doing a virtual reality uh, or augmented reality. So the user might be a person carrying a, um, a phone and that person is going to be uh, blocked by obstacles or other people in between the phone and the um, base station. And so this blockage can be overcome if we have a reflective surface on the wall. An MM wall, the system I'm telling you about uh, today, can serve this functionality by being a reflector. But again, MM wall is configurable. And so these reflections can be steered in arbitrary directions and they can be non-Snellian reflections. And what that means is that they violate Snell's law that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And so the control that MM wall gives can give an angle of reflection that is in fact different from the angle of uh, incidence. And finally, outdoors, MM wall can serve a, uh, a similar um, functionality, reflecting. Finally, link establishment. So when you establish a link between um, a base station and a user, you scan um, and search for the for the right beam that reaches the user. Well, MM wall can split the beam and, and speed up the, um, the beam scanning. And so we have the first, uh, in our system, we have the first uh, surface that can bring outdoor service in, uh, indoors, um, achieve non-specular configuration that um, switches bef between uh, the reflect refractive mode and the uh, reflective mode. So a high level design overview of how it works. We have an incident um, electromagnetic wave um, coming into MM wall here. And MM wall is composed of these um, cells in uh, groups that are made of meta atoms. So meta atoms have a control voltage that uh, gets applied. And the result is that they change the magnitude of the incoming signal. And they also change the phase of the incoming signal um, as a response to the two control voltages um, that we apply to each of the meta atoms. We replicate these meta atoms in different groups, and those different groups form the ribs that you see here. Um, in MM wall with a separate control unit on the side. The result is that the transmitted wave um, can come out and it can be steered in many different directions, or as I said before, it can be also reflected. So how does it work? So this is simulation and, and measurement of the reflection pattern. And you see here that um, over a range of configuration uh, voltages that you see here, UE and UM, we can see that the uh, resulting um, transmission is high and it sweeps through a rainbow of different uh, phase shifts. So here we here on the bottom here, we have the phase shift and we can see that this, the uh, wall is shifting phase both for transmission and also for the reflective mode. So we went through many different design attempts to try to um, uh, achieve this type of uh, um, configuration. And uh, I'm going to take you through those failed design attempts because they're very instructive because it's very challenging to build such a um, such a configuration. And you can look at our archive paper for uh, for more detail here. But copper lines alone, they kind of tend to resonate along with the structure. Um, coil inductors use too many components, with, which interferes with the uh, wave, and radial stubs also interfere with this too much hardware in the middle. And so we use this um, meander structure in order to minimize the use of extra components, avoid a large amount of copper on the paddle, panel, and retain ease of fabrication. So, so as I mentioned before, these meta atoms can steer the beam with a varying phase and that beam comes off using standard um, angle of uh, arrival and array factor computations. We can also split the beam by adding uh, using superposition weighting terms so that we have one incident wave coming in and that results in two waves uh, coming out. So let's see how this works works with a uh, reflective refractive um, establishment. So the base station uh, is going to be sweeping the beam and the, the uh, UE is not going to be able to detect E node B, so the uni UE can signal MM wall to sweep via a control, and then the MM wall can then be sweeping and establish with the user the, the combination of angles that maximizes the SNR. Once in the downlink, we have that uh, link establishment with the uh, user, the beam is aligned, and we have a, 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 um, a, uh, a uh, uh, asymptotic or a, a, a reflexive uh, relationship between the downlink 
and um, uplink so the inode beam can switch its transmit, uh, transmit beam to a receive beam and the uplink beam is uh, established. So we built MMWall uh, in real hardware. These, uh, these ribs are fabricated on Roger's board and uh, we control it and we fabricated it and we deployed it on a, uh, a window of our lab um, and we uh, experimented with a transmitter that was outside and a receiver that's uh, inside. So we can see that indoor to indoor, uh, without MM wall, uh, we have uh, areas where the coverage is extremely poor. And with MM wall, we improve the coverage uh, quite a bit. Outdoor to indoor, uh, same story. With MM wall, we um, improve these outage areas of uh, low coverage. Looking at the uh, looking at the data now. Um, on a uh, on a CDF, we see that the environmental path has a range of SNR. Some of these environmental paths, um, indoor to indoor, have uh, an SNR that will give us very low data rates, below 64 qualm. If we add MM wall, if we add one MM wall, we improve all these links, as you see here. And if we add two MM walls, we uh, further improve the links because we're overcoming blockages. Now moving on to the uh, satellite uh, network scenario, uh, I'll tell you about a, uh, a solution for satellite networks called Wallio, and this is forthcoming in the uh, ACM Hotnets uh, conference or workshop um, coming up soon. So LEO satellite uh, communication involves uplink and downlink, intersatellite uh, links, and also uh, links from the satellites down to uh, user stations, ground stations and user stations um, all over. And um, pretty soon we envision um, user stations and, and satellite links will be useful in trans, uh, transportation, where users are perhaps in a rural area that has poor service and can be served by um, a transport. But uh, you know, there's complex beam alignment and tracking and handover problems in a transportation scenario. In an urban canyon scenario, satellites um, are useful for low latency applications like financial trading, but they're going to have problems reaching down into um, urban canyons. Um, and then in, in rural uh, scenarios, um, uh, away from urban centers, users are going to be well served by satellites. And so in an urban canyon, we have line of sight blockage. And in rural uh, settings, these satellites are very necessary. And so a smart surface can aid uh, for, for transportation, for urban canyon and for rural uh, settings. In the transportation, it's going to help the, uh, the bus or the train enable fast beam alignment and soft handover. In an urban canyon, it's going to use reflection to get the signal down into the urban canyon. And in a rural setting, it's going to uh, improve power consumption. So the Huyens metamaterial surface that I talked about for uh, the previous project, MM wall, is going to be useful here, but it only resonates at one frequency. And so uh, lots of low Earth satellites use uh, two frequencies, or frequency domain uh, division processing. So Starlink, OneWeb, Telesat, there's other providers as well. Um, they're using different uh, frequency bands in the KU and KA and higher frequency bands uh, planned. Um, but the upshot is that the surface needs to be working at both the lower and the upper uh, frequency bands. And so how do we design a surface for these full duplex? So we can partition, but we the best solution is to design a bi-resonant surface element. So if we add directors to make this um, bi-resonant, uh, then what happens is we end up um, by uh, by not overlapping the resonances, and that results in poor performance. If we go to a uh, dual band where we have uh, two rings in our uh, design that's sharing directors, again, that's possible, but performance is not as good. If we add inductors, we're adding um, components, and if we add meander lines, uh, we're also adding um, components and we're shifting frequencies. And so the best solution that we found was a combination of uh, adding inductors and dual band. Um, so we pick inductors for the electric side and we pick meanders for the magnetic side, and this results in uh, fewer components. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll have to leave some time for questions, um, but uh, I want to highlight kind of the, the, uh, the uh, very uh, the novel part parts of uh, the two uh, systems that I told you about today. So MMOL was the first one I told you about, um, 
and it is uh, it's giving a a level of applicability that um, that nobody else has uh, has really achieved. Um, it's configurable between uh, refraction and reflection, so that means that it can shift um, at an instant to outdoors to indoor service or reflecting only uh, indoors and electronically it can steer and split beams and frequency shift beams almost a full 360 degrees. Uh, Wally, the second um, system I told you about is for satellite data, data networks. It's ongoing work and uh, I invite you all to come to uh, the Hotnets uh, workshop and uh, see my student Casey uh, give a talk there and we're prototyping and experimenting with that. And these are the first designs that we we're aware of that realize the potential of these new surfaces called huge end surfaces. And they're overcoming fundamental challenges in, in uh, millimeter wave um, RF design and uh, control. So um, I'll wrap up there, but I'll just, uh, I'll just add that uh, my group is hiring and uh, the, uh, the Princeton Advanced uh, Wireless Systems Lab or PAWS that I run, so um, if you're a student or a, a young researcher, I encourage you to go to pause.princeton.edu and um, look at the other projects that uh, we have done and uh, get in touch because uh, interested in, in talking to you. So I'll turn my camera on and I think you can see me now and I will uh, take any questions. Thank you. Professor Kale. So uh, I think one one audience uh, uh, raised, he, raised uh, her his hand. Bei uh, uh, Ouyang, yeah. Maybe you can ask a question. Uh, hi Kale. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Hi Kale. Thanks. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so we can see that your research always focus on the uh, active beta surface. And uh, we can say that uh, active metal surface pretty uh, uh, have pretty powerful function, but the control and the cost of the active metal surface is pretty high as well. On the other hand, the passive metal surface can achieve pretty powerful man manipulation as well. So, uh, how do you balance the trade off of uh, active metal surface and passive metal surface? Sure. So, so. Um... You know, I think the the component cost is going to come down, and um, I think it does naturally balance. So I, I guess you're asking about the the cost of active versus cost of passive. So with a with an active uh, surface, there's lots of work I'm aware of. Um, I uh, I was at IEEE um, Globecom and uh, IEEE um, uh, Infocom, Globecom, and uh, and um, uh, ICC and there was a uh, sessions on uh, on smart surfaces there and uh, I, I saw lots of work on active uh, surface with an active surface you need fewer elements because um, you uh, you have amplifiers and so um, the way to think about it is to run a link budget and uh, with a link budget you you know how many elements of the surface you need and uh, I say it balances because with an active surface you need fewer elements because you have amplification. With a passive uh, surface, you need uh, more elements, um, but we can make them cheaper because amplifiers are themselves expensive. And I, I think that uh, cost is going to come down long term. And when there's a when there's a use case, we should, as researchers, um, I don't think too closely with uh, on cost because I, I know that once the once the use case um, uh, is is uh, compelling then uh, cost will come down. OK, so about the control of active metal surface, it will require uh, like multiple FPGA to control all the elements on the active metal surface. So uh, I think it's a pretty complex control for the uh, for the surface design. Uh, can you give some comments on this? Sure. So, so the control is pretty simple. So, it the control doesn't need a full um, uh, the control doesn't really need a full FPGA. In fact, uh, a simple um, you know a simple um, programmable interrupt controller or a simple logic controller um, will do. And um, we have ways of aggregating the control 
So this, the, the elements themselves may be in the hundreds or thousands, but that does not imply that uh, the control, there have to be hundreds of thousands of control lines. Um, so aggregation of the control lines, sharing uh, that one control line to many elements um, brings that down. So I don't see I don't see control as being a fundamentally um, hard problem. I think it's an interesting engineering problem, um, but I, I think we know how to overcome those those engineering uh, hurdles. OK, thank you so much. That's all for my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, the next one who raised uh, his hand is Luo Cheng. Yeah, Luo Cheng, due to the lim li time limitation, maybe you should keep your question uh, simple and brief. Thank you, Luo Cheng, sure, please go sure, ahead. Yeah. I, I have a very simple question about your presentation and the research uh, itself. Yeah, you are talking about a uh, metal surface that help uh, new communication with in inside the door and in the car, like for example. The question is how it affects the single uh, receive single strength of uh, satellite uh, satellite single. I mean, yeah, you, how your surface you know refraction and transportation, how the single uh, how single stress can be after passing or reflecting by your surf meta surface. Yeah. I see, okay, so uh, I, I'll rephrase the question. I think I think you are you're asking. Um, is there a loss in signal strength after yeah, going exactly. through the okay yeah yeah no so our surface is um so the type of surface is called a huge ends meta surface and um we designed it so that the loss is um less than five percent uh, when it goes through and so that's actually a really um challenging uh thing to do because millimeter wave um mm -hmm. And higher frequencies, they're easily lost, as exactly. you know. So, um, so the way we designed it, um, and you can you can read this in the archive paper that I reference. Um, and you can go to my website. You can go to pause.princeton.edu, and you can um, find the archive papers. Um, it's a good question. And um, basically, the uh, the the type of surface has the resonators. So sometimes the the resonators, you know, they're ring resonators, and sometimes they're flat. Um, uh, facing the direction of the radio signal. Uh, these resonators are turned uh, with the direction of the uh, radio signal, and that means there's some air gap in between the resonators. And um, we have the first surface that, um, that kind of designs this in a full sheet and scales this up. So physicists actually designed this, but they only did it in like a one-dimensional um, way and without any electronic control, but we have the first real surface uh, that's scaled up and electronically controlled. Um, and because we have those air gaps, uh, the, the resonators, they work the same way they would if it's flat. So if you read the papers, you will find many papers with, um, with resonators that uh, are, are like this, and the signal gets blocked by whatever board substrate it is. So if it's Rogers or if it's F4B or FR4, the, the signal gets blocked. If you turn them and get air, air gaps, then most of the surface is actually air, which we know does, does not block. And so um, and so that's uh, we that's why we achieve close to one uh, 100 percent um, efficiency. And we do. And it's amazing. So if we do the right control, Either it goes through the surface or it reflects off the surface just based on the electricity, the electric control. So um, and, and and the efficiency when it reflects is also close to one. I think it's 90 percent, 95 percent efficient when it reflects. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I will go to your website and read the paper archive. Sure. And, and thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, thank you for the question. Good question. Our next question comes from Pang Hao. Sorry. Pang Hao, would you like to go ahead? Uh, hi, hi, Kim. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. And I have a simple question about uh, the uh, metal atom design. So do we need to design two rings of the electrical and uh, magnetic field to 
uh, implement the meta auto. Uh, I, I, I see some related papers use uh, a simple structure to achieve the similar function, and they can and um, and implement the electric and the magnetic field and, and use a simple uh, structure. Yeah. So uh, why why do we need the two? And electrical and medical rings yeah, too. Yeah. That's a good yeah. question. Yeah, I, I, I've so we we did a, we we read all these papers as well, and um, there are no uh, papers that uh, there's no work that I've seen um, at millimeter wave. So you can find work at different frequencies, lower frequencies, um, but there's no work at millimeter wave that does both reflective and the transmissive and it's reconfigurable so you can find work at millimeter wave that's static so it's not reconfigurable so you might as well have like um just like a a metal a shaped metal reflector there and that would do the same thing right but so so you can find work that is like that but it's not reconfigurable and so the only structure um, that I'm aware of, to my knowledge, um, that is both reconfigurable and works at millimeter wave, needs to be um, have two sides. It's pretty simple though. So it's a it's a board, and you have a trace on one side, you have a trace on the other side, and that's very cheap to make. Just put copper on on both sides of the board. That's uh, the marginal co incremental cost. It's it's uh, it's pretty simple, and so. Um, you know the and going back to the previous question when you when you do that you get the magnetic and the electric fields right because as you know radio is magnetic and electric so there's an advantage and that's how we achieve the high um the high efficiency so if you want 100 percent efficiency or 95 percent efficiency you need to do it right with the with the uh, two sides and 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 that's uh, that's what we achieve with that thank you thank you for your answer